Hey there, everyone. Today, we're exploring Ephesians 4. Paul urges us to live a life worthy of our calling. Think of this as receiving a VIP pass to live out our highest purpose. We'll talk about unity, maturity, and using our gifts to build up the church. It's all about growing together and supporting each other on this journey of faith. Hey, I want to get into this sermon today by first looking at some ways in which we can really flex our consumer muscle. Like how good of a consumer are you at spotting the real and the fake? And so I want to just throw some items on the screen here for a minute. Uh, Maybe you're someone that has a, a Gucci bag. Which one is real and which one's fake? You got an idea? At any campus, just shout it out maybe. Well, look, the one on the left is the real one, and the one on the right is the fake one. Some are like, I don't know. I don't have a care. It doesn't matter to me. How about Nikes? Anybody a sneaker geek around here? Which one's real and which one's fake? Hard to tell, isn't it? But the one on the left is real, and the one on the right is fake. Back in the day, I think it easier, right, to spot a, a fake, like a $15 Rolex being pulled out of the duffel bag on the corner of the street, you knew automatically, this is probably not a real Rolex that I'm buying. But right now, I mean, this day and age, it's hard to spot a real and a fake. I mean, you don't know if you're getting Oakleys or Jokeleys or (laughs) Nikes or Likeleys. It doesn't matter what you think you're getting. And and if uh, you're sitting here thinking, yeah, I I don't know. I probably have a pair of something fake or something, you know, a Louis Vuitton bag that's more like a Louis Bitten bag that I bought at a flea market or something. Uh, I don't know if it's real or fake. Listen, it's hard to tell the difference in anything nowadays if it's real and fake, right? Like with the invention of Photoshop and other AI inventions that have come around, you're going, I don't know, is this real? Is this fake? You need to keep that in mind as we talk about the subject today of unity. Because there's some churches that know how to fake unity really well. They know how to smile at you on Sunday and stab you in the back on Monday. And Paul says, let's not be that kind of church. So I want to look at Ephesians 4 as you kind of figure out what's real and what is fake because Paul highlights the genuine article, and that's Jesus Christ. And he says, if you want to get real in unity, then you need to follow the genuine article of Jesus. And friends, I'm here to tell you that in the book of Ephesians, they were working their sandals off trying to achieve unity because there were two groups that just didn't get along. There were the Jews and the Gentiles. And the problem was they had absolutely nothing in common. And Paul's message is pretty simple. Church put up with one another. Like just, there's more that connects us than divides us. Can you just imagine some kind of committee that was put together to form a church picnic in the church of Ephesus and the Gentiles are trying to get along with the Jews and the Gentiles are like, okay, so for the picnic, you guys want to grill pork chops? (laughs) And the Jews are like, no, how about we just boil some lentils? You know, like that's not going to work for us. And Paul says, listen, there's going to be moments of incredible tension in the church. There's going to be moments where you just go, I don't know if we have a lot in common here. And Paul says, it's not going to be easy, but it becomes easier when you get back to the core tenets of our faith. And those are the things that unite us. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, to re-embrace what it is that Paul has called all of us to, two groups being one. He says, he, meaning Jesus, made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new People, Yeah, we're a new humanity in Christ Jesus from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God. And when we get into Ephesians 4 now, what we're going to study, which is page 948 in the Bible that's in the chair rack in front of you, and if you just have a smart device, just get on your, you know, your, your web browser and type in Ephesians 4. We're just going to follow along with it. Paul's goal is to say, hey, listen, there's more that unites us than d- divides us. And what I love about Paul is he doesn't focus in on how bad people might be or how nasty people can become within church or any circle. He just simply focuses on the real McCoy of Jesus Christ and says, can we be more like Jesus? Shouldn't we be more like Jesus? Look how he begins in chapter four of verse one. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, now catch these words, to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. It's also been translated, and maybe it's translated like this in your Bible, walk in, a worthy, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. Like God's called all of us to follow after Christ. And he begins with kind of these four highlighted character traits of Jesus. Did you catch what they were? Here's what they are. Look at verse two. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Friends, can I just say, if we just adhered those four things to our lifestyle and treated everybody humbly, gently, patiently, and with love, there would be no disunity in the church. There'd be very less disunity within the world. And you need to remember that Paul's just steering them back to say, 
We are of Christ and God works within us. And these should be represented in our own life. We should be men and women who are humble, men and women who are gentle. We should be defined by our patience and we should be known by our love. These are Christian attributes that Paul lays down, essential elements that unite the church. So let's just, let's just make a section of scripture here. Let's just title it our glue. That's Ephesians chapter four, one through six. And this is the stuff that just binds us together, the glue of the church, because the apostle Paul really digs deep on this and says, there's more that we have in common than that what divides us. I know there's a lot of things that we try to find in common, things like sports teams, or maybe it's our, where our kids go to school or alma mater or I don't know, people find connection on what TV show they like or their favorite taco place, but let's face it, that stuff does not last forever, right? And so Paul says, shouldn't there be some internal, eternal foundational things that we should all agree on that should unite us? Some bigger things than sports teams, some bigger things than our alma mater or where our kids go to school? And Paul doesn't mess around here. He gets right to the heart of it and he tells us about the rock solid, essential foundational stuff that draws a church together. And when we get this right, church, we get unity right. Look at verses three and six of Ephesians chapter four. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. There is one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Did you catch those seven essential and foundational truths that glue the church together? If you didn't, let's just throw them on the screen for a minute. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and yes, one God, one body. What does that even mean? Well, we're called the body of Christ, where Christ is the head, and we are held together by the head of Christ, and we are one body. Friends, that means that we are not the only Christians, but we are Christians only. And we have an allegiance that takes a higher precedence than anything else in this world, an allegiance to Christ Jesus. One spirit, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit. Friends, there's not multiple spirits of God, there's one spirit, and every believer is filled with the spirit of God. And we have that in common. What's that one hope? That is an assurance that there is credibility and confidence in who God is and what he's gonna accomplish. I know that hope often is thought about heaven and that we are one day gonna be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Truly, that's part of the one hope that we all share. But the greater hope is that God is faithful and will accomplish all that he said he will accomplish. Friends, we share that same hope. And how about that one Lord? That's a reference to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that each and one of us have put ourselves under his teaching. And now we're defined by Christ's example. And we fall under a line of his morals and his ethics. And so that we don't just make our own and we don't go by a different standard. We're all running the same standard together, the standard of our Lord Jesus Christ. One faith, that's all of our desperate need for Jesus as our savior. Listen, let's not think for a moment that we're saving ourselves. We all have a desperate need for Jesus Christ and his saving grace. And we all have that in common. And that one, that one baptism I know it's been misinterpreted in so many different places, but ultimately Paul's saying, we all share in the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we all have that in common as well. And in case you think, okay, well, I don't have everything in common. No, we all have the same God that we believe in. And how does Paul define this God? He defines this and he says, this is our father. You know what that makes us? Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in the faith. And Paul says, we are a part of the same spiritual family. Friends, there is more that unites us than there is that divides us. And one of the essential bonds of the church is these core tenets to our faith. And once those break apart, you invite division to the party and everyone starts bringing in their own drama and everyone starts bringing in their own division and the church is fractured and weakened by it. Let me tell you, about 25 years ago, I've been here almost 25 years, I can't even believe that. I first came to Bethany, I walked right into the middle of what was known as a church split. It wasn't some kind of juicy scandal that was going on, nothing like that, just good people who were just kind of fed up with the church not accomplishing a whole lot. And I think hiring a 22-year-old senior pastor probably didn't help a little bit. You know, I think there was probably a lot of people who were like eye-rolling and whispering complaints, but as time passed on, and as that split kind of settled out, and about 90 of us remained, people started to let go of their differences. They started to let go of their agenda. It's kind of a miraculous thing. We all kind of got back to the foundations of our faith. It was a great and defining moment for Bethany Christian Church because we started to work together as a team rather than trying to get our own agenda involved. And we had some big and radical shifting changes coming, things where we were gonna focus 
on the outward of the church and have outreach and evangelism. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for the core tenets of people just saying, it's about our seven foundation essentials here that we agree on and we can get along, none of that would have been accomplished. We didn't rally around a vision. We didn't rally around a mission or a purpose. We rallied around the core tenets that we had in faith. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. We could all agree on that. And God was doing a good work in us that we didn't even recognize so he could ultimately do a good work through us. And church, listen, no matter what divisions you might face in any church, even Bethany Christian Church, you can always count on that when the seven essential, foundational, eternal truths are in our church, that Christ will be exalted and we will be unified because there is more connecting us that could ever tear us apart. But when you focus on something else, like your own agenda, or trying to get your own way, or when you try to take one of those foundational elements out, that's when division and fraction begins to happen. Let's title this next section, Our Guide. Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 10. Like a great preacher, what Paul does is he emphasizes Jesus, and he emphasizes the example of Jesus, and how Jesus is our ultimate guide. So listen, if you're in a place, or in a church, or in a church group that happens to be divided, all you need to look to is our faithful and trustworthy guide of Jesus on how to get reunified quick, fast, and in a hurry. Because you might you know, find someone in your life that you admire. Have you ever, have, oh, the, the old adage is, don't meet your heroes. You ever heard that adage before? Because when you do, you'll be let down. But the truth is about Jesus, the closer you get to him, and the more you get to know him, the more glorious that he actually becomes. That's why I'm saying study the genuine article of Jesus. And Paul starts off, and verse 8 through 10 by saying, it's Jesus' grace that has given us salvation. And so he starts to give us one of the core traits of Jesus, Jesus' grace. And then he writes in verses 9 and 10, what does he ascend mean except that he also descends to the lower earthly regions? He who descends is the very one who ascends higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. What's even Paul saying here. He's just reminding us that Jesus Christ, who should be exalted as the highest on the totem pole, became the lowest of all beings. You can even get into 1 Peter. You can find out that Jesus even went and spoke to those prisoners in hell after his crucifixion, meaning he lowered himself and humbled himself and even went to a, the place of Hades. But yet, on this rocket ship moment, God exalted him to a higher place. Why is Paul sharing this with the church? He's saying, listen, it's the grace of Jesus Christ that has bonded us with God. And it's the humbling of Jesus Christ and the willingness to be humbled that has bonded us with God. And these two traits are essential for unity in the church, grace and humility. You know what grace means? I'm going to put up with you even though you're very hard to love right now. You know what humility means? That I'm going to be quick to listen, I'm going to be slow to speak, and I'm going to be slow to get angry. Friends, we have to remember from the standpoint of sin, humility also means I'm going to check myself before I wreck myself. Like before I start pointing the fingers at other people and saying, you're the problem, I might want to just kind of turn my fingers back on myself and say, maybe, maybe I'm the problem and the problem's closer to home. Because the best way to escape disunity is to follow Jesus out of it and get back to unity. How do you do it? You become a person that is humble. You become a person that's gracious, just like Jesus Christ was. Then you'll find that others will be exalted, others will be loved, and it will be glorious and uplifting and strengthening to the church. Friends, church, church, listen, Jesus is our guide. Jesus is the example on how to stay unified. When, when it's not smooth selling for a church and people start making waves, Jesus is the one we look to. Like if he could be humble and gracious with people like you and me, then, then I think you and me can be humble and gracious with problematic people and unsettled situations. We can let harmony become the hallmark of our church in any church. And I think that even goes with the person that always wants to complain about how loud the music is or how long the sermons are, you know? And, and by the way, sermons are long. You're just getting your money's worth. Think of it that way. <laughs> Paul moves from talking about the glue. He talks about, talks about the guide, our, our Lord Jesus. And then he moves into something a little bit more personal here that I'm calling this section, our growth. He looks at us and says, how are you growing? Aren't you growing? Because you should be growing in the faith and you should be maturing in unity. This is Ephesians chapter four, verse 11 and 16. Here's the truth. We all have some growing to do as it comes down to contributing to the unity of the church. 
And what we find in verse 11 and following is that God has actually equipped some people in the church so that you can grow and so that you can be mature in unity. Look at verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers five different gifts of God's Holy Spirit to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That word means strengthened and strong until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. There are a lot of gifts of the Holy Spirit, but Paul focuses on five of them in Ephesians 4. He focuses on the ones that are about church leadership and teaching the Lord's people. That's the gifts that you usually find in pastors and elders and preachers. These gifts of the Holy Spirit are there so that you can mature and grow in unity. Now, here's the thing. If the leadership, though, in your church is causing disunity, you need to run away from it like a four-alarm fire because the leadership of the church shouldn't be causing disunity. The leadership of the church should be encouraging and fostering only unity and pointing people back to the example of Jesus and the seven foundation of our faith. But here's the thing. Here's where you come in. Every baptized believer, did you know this? Every baptized believer has a gift of the Holy Spirit, something that has been imparted to you when you gave your life over to Jesus that can build up the church and strengthen it. That Holy Spirit is there to do three things within the church. Are you ready for this? To grow the church numerically, to serve the church in the name of the Lord, and to strengthen the church so that God's kingdom prevails in this world. Friends, if you're not using your gifts, you're not just missing out. You're not helping the unity of the church. So let's be clear. Unity is not about sitting back, staying quiet, not making waves, and, going with the, not, and just kind of going with the flow. It's actually an active activity that's building and pushing the church forward. Think of it like this. We're all in the same boat. Everybody's got an oar to hold and to row with. And trust me, it's a lot harder to rock the boat when you're rowing the boat, right? So grab your oar and let's get to serving the Lord, growing his church, and strengthening church with the Holy Spirit that's within us. So let me ask you, are you here and really contributing to the church? Because when you contribute to the church and use your Holy, and use your Holy Spirit gifts, you're not just here for the free coffee any longer. You're here to actually contribute rather than to consume. And you're someone that can actually bring strength to the body of Christ. Yeah, even you, by using your spiritual gifts. I know there's some of you right now, you're like, what are these spiritual, like you keep, you keep talking about spiritual gifts, what are these? And you're a believer and you don't know. Can, let me just, here's what you need to do if you're like checked out on what I'm talking about right now. You need to get into one of our Discover Bethany experiences at all of our campuses. Okay, so you, you can find out what your Holy Spirit gifts are and how they can encourage the church and strengthen the church and grow the church. And you can be a man and woman on fire so that you can grow the church of Jesus Christ and actually contribute to it rather than just consume it. And I love what Paul says, that, that these five positions that you see listed off here, they're there to equip the people for good works of service. And what he's actually saying is, you need to put yourself in a place of teaching. You need to put yourself in a place where you're growing. And like... He's not saying just grow. He's saying grow up. Church, some of us just need to grow up. And we just not need to get with the program and say, yeah, I'm not adding any value to the church. I'm just kind of sitting here. And I thought that not making waves was good enough. Paul says, no, you need to grab an oar and start paddling. And you need to start growing in your faith and growing up in your spiritual life. Because we're being led by faithful church leaders. I don't think, I don't want to brag about the church. But listen, I don't think you understand how healthy a church like Bethany Christian Church is. A place where you can go, where there's out scandal, where there's out doctrinal issues. We're not arguing or bickering over things that really don't matter. For the most part, every single one of us is on mission and on fire to do outreach and to grow the kingdom of God, to strengthen the church and to, to serve in the church. That's an important place, Bethany Christian Church. You don't see too many churches kind of like that. And I've been in churches that aren't like that. And let me tell you, it's no fun to be a part of that kind of place. But when you find a church that is unified and has the foundations of our faith, you can find yourself saying, I want to grow and I want to grow up to become more mature, to keep this place healthy and strong. And that's exactly what Apostle Paul says in verses 14 and 15. He says, you start holding on to growing up and maturing, then you'll no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. 
Instead, speaking the truth in love, you will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. What's Paul saying? He's saying our immaturity and our lack of knowledge is the very thing that leads to disunity. That's what he's saying. Your immaturity and your lack of knowledge of the scriptures is the very thing that quickly lead to disunity. There's a faithful guy in um, our brotherhood named Tom Rainier who goes around and he helps churches that are always in trouble. And uh, he tries to get them as healthy as possible, but he's been around so many different churches. He's heard the most ridiculous reasons as to why they split and they break apart from each other. Here's just a few. One of them fought over whether they should build a children's playground on the empty church lot or start a cemetery. I don't know. One promotes life. One promotes death. That's an easy discussion to have, I would think. There was a debate and a church split over what picture of Jesus to hang in the church lobby space. I, I don't know. I, like, I don't know how you get there, but I guess you get there. And the last one was an argument that was about deviled eggs. Should that be a part of the church meal? I mean, honestly, deviled eggs? My suggestion would be add a little angel food cake and everything's okay, right? <laughs> is it potluck or is it blessed luck? I don't, I don't know which, which it is, but you know, people are trying to figure that out and Paul wasn't joking, though, when he wrote verse 16. Look at it on the screen. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, what does it do? It grows and builds itself up in what? Love, as each part does what? It's work. Not it's sit around. It's work. So the Holy Spirit that's within us, church, is the very thing that unites us and keeps us active. And friends, when you're on a mission for God, you have very little time to focus on the minor's you can only major in the important parts of the faith. And when we let Christ do a good work in us and through us, we don't have time to argue. We don't have time to waste over silly stuff. Uh, we won't have time to argue over deviled eggs or pictures of Jesus. Instead, we'll just kind of focus in on the walk that God has called us to walk in. And it will be our important work to serve the Lord, to grow the church, and to strengthen the church. And Paul's been around church long enough to know that there were just some people in the church that had just said, I'm not going to get along with others. He knows that. He knows that there's people in the church that are like, I'm gonna smile at you on Sunday and then stab you on the back on Monday. He recognized that there's Christians in name only. Folks who demand their way at all times, they try to put on a happy face, and they try to belong to the church, but they don't wanna bring the unity to the church. Let's call this next section the grappling, okay? Because that's what Paul really focuses on, Chapter 4, 17 through 31. It's a big swath of scripture because the church is struggling. And there were people that were in Christians by name only. They demanded their way. And so Paul has all these imperatives, which are commands, meaning you get this done now, like a father would instruct his children. Look at verse 17. Paul says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Hey, just the fact that Paul says, you must no longer, means that there were some people that were still involved in disunifying the church. They've hit the I'm done button when it came to unity, and they've gone back to their own selfishness and their own sinfulness. Friends, these, friends, these people weren't speaking the truth in love when it came time for disagreement. They weren't seeking forgiveness when they've wounded somebody. And the root of their issue, well, Paul says in verse 18, take a look. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God. Paul says, no, it's not that they're just disunified in the church. They're disunified from God himself. That's how they got here. The reason why they complain, the reason why they bicker, the reason why they create waves and keep the church from the mission of growth and serving and being healthy is because they've really disconnected themselves with God. Ouch, right? Like Paul really gets to the heart of it here. And he says, they haven't embraced Christ. They haven't chosen the things of God. They've actually abandoned him and they want the church to be their membership club rather than a place that is diligently serving one another and growing the kingdom of God. And Paul explains that when you're disconnected from God, here's what happens. He goes on to say, your heart gets hardened. He goes on to say, you lose your compassion for one another. You become, uh, you become a person that is focused on your own agenda, and spoiler alert, your agenda is not God's agenda, and you're literally walking away from unity. And then he begins to paint this picture. Here's the picture that Paul paints. It's like you're treating Jesus like a coat. You put him on when you need to put him on, 
when you're inside the church building around other Christians and then you throw them off and you put them in the closet when you want to do your own thing and you put on the coat that says, I'll do what I want when I want to, when I want to do it. Thank you very much. And you only, you only wear Jesus when it's convenient for you. I, I think there's a term for that. There's a lot of terms for that. One of them's hypocrite, two-faced, counterfeit, fake. You, you pick whatever term you want. It doesn't matter. But let's be honest here. Nobody wants to be labeled that way, do we, in the faith? And so Paul makes it crystal clear. This chameleon behavior, Jesus did not teach you this chameleon behavior. You did not learn this from the example of Jesus. You learned from Jesus to be humble. You learned from Jesus to be gentle and be patient and to be kind and be loving. But you didn't learn this chameleon behavior of loving one moment and then stabbing people in the back the next from Jesus. So look at verse 22 and 24. It's on the screen. We were taught to regard the former way of life, to listen to these words, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to, catch it, put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. I know there's some in the church that wrestle with this, this put off and put on mindset. The struggle's real. That's why I called it the grappling. Some of you are grappling with this issue right now. You are certainly the one that is putting the coat on of Christ at some times and taking it off. Paul says that quickly leads to disunity in the church. Your inconsistent character of Christ leads to disunity. Remember, you're the church. You're the church, not the building. You're the church. And you can make it stronger or weaker depending on whether you want to live for yourself or live for Jesus. And when you demand your way and live your way, you're actually standing in the way of the church's unity. So let's get into this put off, put on stuff, because here's what the Apostle Paul says. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, Paul says, put off unwholesome talk. And church, what should we put on? Speaking truth and being loving with it. Ephesians 4, verse 26 and 27, Paul says, put off sinful anger. What should we put on, church? righteous anger. You're saying there's a righteous anger? Yeah, the things that God gets angry about, it's okay for the church to get angry about. But all that other foolish stuff, let it go. Let it simmer. Put it away. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28, put off dishonest gain. Church, what do we need to put on? Honest work. Let's build up the church, not just take from it. Let's be people that are contributing rather than being spiritual freeloaders. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29, Paul says, put off unwholesome talk. What are we to put on, church? Edifying speech. Use your words to encourage others. And if your words aren't encouraging others, maybe just don't say anything at all because that's what we're called to do is to edify people with our speech. And lastly, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 31. Put off hateful attitudes and actions. What are we to put on, church? Loving attitudes and actions. Like our old destructive ways are like a bad sequel, never to be going back to again. And the Spirit is grieved Paul says, when we revert back to our old selves and we fail to honor Christ Jesus and fail to strengthen his church. So what you do has an effect on the people around you. And Paul's making it clear. Put off some things, put on some things. And my question to you is, what do you need to put off and put on? What is it that struck you in that list of things that hit your heart and said, ooh, I need to put this off and to put this on for the sake of being consistent with Christ and the sake of the unity of his church? Hey, this last part, Ephesians 4, the last verse of the scripture, 432, let's title this section God's grace. So here, Paul uses kindergarten terms to tell us his thesis. Here's his thesis. Be kind. And be compassionate to each other. Forgive each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Did you catch it? It's like chapter four for dummies. If you didn't understand the full chapter, if you didn't understand what I just had to preach on, all you need to know is Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind, be loving, be forgiving, just like God forgave you in Christ Jesus. Okay, that doesn't mean that you just go, okay, I'm frustrated and I'm not going to tell anybody. No, that leads probably to greater frustration. If you're frustrated about something, you need to remember how much God forgave you. And, and maybe it's a little grudge, and you can say, you know what, I'm going to let that go. But maybe it's something bigger. I'm going to go talk to the right person about this, rather than talk to everybody else but the right person. Having a new nature doesn't mean you don't ever feel angry ever again, or you're, you're never bitter ever anymore. No, no, Paul's saying, 
You're going to be bitter. You're going to be angry. But in those moments, let's remember, be kind, be compassionate. I mean, forgive each other, just as Christ has forgiven you. I mean, let's be mindful of what Jesus teaches about how we dishonor others. He says in Matthew 6, verse 15, if you do not forgive others their sin, then neither will the Father forgive you of your sin. So your forgiveness has a direct impact on how God forgives you. And we need to wise up that the way we distribute grace is the way that grace will be distributed to us. It's like the old story I heard about a couple celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. And all the grandkids were there. They were newlyweds. And they asked grandma, 50 years, how in the world were you able to put up with grandpa for 50 years? She said, well, it's easy. You know, when we first got married, I just made a list of the 10 biggest faults of your grandfather. And I just decided I was going to overlook those 10 big faults. Of course, the grandkids were just like, well, tell us, what are those 10 big faults? She said, you know, I, I never wrote them down. Not once. Just when he did something that made me mad, I just thought, you know what? He's lucky that's one of the 10. And I think, church, if we just had that attitude, if we just kind of had that, that same mindset, hey, you should be lucky that's one of the 10. And I'm going to forgive that fault, and I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let God's grace prevail in this one. How different would the church be? How different would your life be? How different would your home be? If you just said, I'm going to... I'm going to dish out the grace that I've experienced from God. I'm going to forgive as quickly as Christ Jesus has forgiven me. You, you, don't want, you want to know the answer to all this division in the world and division in the church? I know you're going, well, yeah, it's unity. No, no, no. Because unity has all those concepts of uniformity. Like I got to be like them to be accepted by them. No, no, no. We're not talking about commonality. We're not talking about uniformity here. We're talking about unity that you can be different and still loved, that you can have a different background and still be accepted, that you can have a different way of looking at the world and still be welcome. That's what unity is. Here's the thing, I've been a part of a lot of sports teams, okay? And, and we all wore the same uniform and we had the uniformity stuff down. But when we got on the ball field, or there was zero unity. Like we, we looked like a team, but we didn't know how to play like a team. So let me remind you of this. Paul is saying, that because of Christ Jesus, there is now only one race, the human race. And there is only one problem, and that is sin. And there is only one Savior, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is only one hope, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one body, and friends, that is the church. And you as a believer are a part of the church, like that or not. And God's solution to our division? Well, it's completely different than what the world offers, but it's not a distant idea. The solution to any church division is always, are you ready? Jesus. That's the solution. The common foundation, the common denominator of our faith, Christ Jesus, him crucified. And so while we might wear a different name, might have a different background, while we might all not go to the same church, we are bonded together under the name of Jesus. The most unifying name in history. The name of Jesus. And friends, if you haven't come to Jesus and have allowed him to become your name and he become the savior of your life and now you are Christian and that is it, you can do so by coming to Jesus Christ and being buried with him in baptism, sharing in the death, burial, resurrection, and finding one of those core foundations of our faith, forgiveness and love and being part of his church to help strengthen this bride of Christ and to go on the mission of Christ to make other disciples who make other disciples who make other disciples. Friends, when we fully commit ourselves to Jesus and to following him, this world will never see anything like the church and the unity and the love that we possess. Will you pray with me? Fathers, we move out of here today. I know we're gonna be facing a world that is hostile to our faith and has been completely divided by a number of things. I mean, politics comes to mind right now. Uh, divisions of wealth, even our own skin color or background or ethnicity. But Father, may the church shine brightly like a city on a hill that is so diverse and so welcoming and so loving that the world stands back in awe 
about this great mystery, how unity could happen through such great diversity. And may they know that it's only because of you, Father, only because of Jesus. And it's not that we have the same sports team in common, it's because we have the same Lord in common. We have one body and one faith and one hope. And so, Father, may you be our bond. And may not just Bethany Church, but your church be more unified today than ever before. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.